It seems like God just continues to bring information. This is not information that I go looking for. Uh, one of the things that um, I've experienced now, now I'm not everybody can do how they want to do it, but in my life, uh, I usually share what I've been inspired to share. Uh, we can all study, and study's good. Matter of fact, I love what the scripture says. It says, "Study to show yourself approved." A worker rightly dividing the word of truth, right? But can you study enough to get God to approve you? So we must misunderstand that. See, so I'm going to say the same thing, but I'm going to put it in the new covenant perspective. Study to show yourself you're approved, that you're a worker, and you can rightly divide the word of truth. Does that sound different? So you don't study to get God to approve you. You study to show yourself that God has approved you through Jesus Christ. That we get our righteousness, we get our value and our dignity, our identity from Jesus Christ. Not for what we do for him, but what for he's done for us. One of the things that we understand about the new covenant, and this has nothing to do with about, she just wanted me to talk some. So one of the things about the old covenant is the old covenant, everybody did things for God. You, you can hear it in religion. Religious organization will say, well, I'm doing this for God. Well, that's old covenant way of doing things. In the new covenant, you're doing things from him. See, in the old covenant, you were trying to work your way in his favor. Since we have his favor, now we're working our way from heaven to earth. Most people believe the gospel is about living in a certain way, doing certain things so we can go to heaven someday. Even though that's true, if we're going to go to heaven someday, if you go to heaven, you're still coming back behind a great white horse to rule and reign on earth. Heaven is not your final destination. What we need to understand is the gospel is not about living in a way to get out of here. The gospel that Jesus Christ taught his people that followed him was to how to find hell on earth and bring heaven to it. Making a difference while you live here. Ruling and reigning. Uh, most people don't even understand that Adam in the garden was not created to go to heaven. He was created to live on earth and when he fell he didn't fall from heaven he fell from authority he fell from the likeness of god he had the image and the likeness and when he fell he lost that spirit that he was created with and uh, i remember when when i was in longview texas and god began yeah god uh, began to give me this uh show me in scripture the story i'm dyslexic so I see things in pictures, and reading uh, is getting better, but it's always been hard. And so when I get a picture or a vision, I just begin to see it and, and see it in the Scripture. And God had me hold this message for three years before I shared it. I knew what church I was supposed to share it at, when I was supposed to share it. And uh, three years came. It took them three years to invite me. And uh, they finally opened the door, and I knew that this, what message and this, that was the beginning of it. And, and every year, God just faithful, just brings more and more stuff. And there's nothing wrong with studying. Uh, but this is just stuff that God just brings. And it's amazing. Uh, one thing the problem, Americans have a problem with, how many Americans have we have here? Raise your hand. <laughs> By this crowd participant. Wait a minute, what's, 
this is April 3rd. April 3rd. And this is Saturday? Saturday before Resurrection Day. I don't know if you know this, but every April 3rd, if it lands, whenever it lands on a Saturday, it's Crowd Participation Day. Nationwide. <laughs> Nationwide. So you don't have to feel like you're being alone. Do it. Well, I'm the only, no, everybody's participating with a speaker somewhere in America today. So just, just do that. But Ask again. Uh, do I? <laughs> and so uh, j just let me make this real short and sweet. Uh, we'll go down this list. Uh, the one things we're going to find, uh, the things we're going to talk about tonight is that Jesus is the Lamb. He's the Messiah. He's our high priest. He is the king, and he is a rabbi with what is called Samika. And everything that we're sharing in tonight will, will totally magnify Jesus in your life. Our heart, join our heart, our, is real simple. We want Jesus to be bigger in your life, the resurrection to be more effective. And we want you today, when you leave here, if you stay to the very end, and we're, we're trying to keep you here by giving you food but i really believe you'll understand in a better way how much jesus really does love you and i believe you'll understand it in a way that it will cause it when that's manifested in your life you'll really love him more because you can't love him more without him, you knowing he loves you the way he does and you can't help it this is divided up in two sections uh, the first section, we're going to go from, uh, say, the Seder meal uh, backwards. We're going to start uh, in between there, but we're going to go from the Seder meal backwards into Scripture. And then we're going to take a break, and we're going to eat. And then we come back, and we're going to ask you to take your time and eat, but don't take two hours. I think what hour, we've got brisket and all kinds of stuff, but... And after that, we're going to get into, uh, it's all good stuff, but after, after we eat and we come back, we're going to go from the, from the garden to the end. And this originally started out being called Gate to Gate. It was a message that, from what Jesus did at, when he entered the eastern gate in Jerusalem until he reached the heavenly gate in heaven. And everything that happened in between, which most people don't know what happened in between, even though the scriptures tells us. Most of the study that we're going to glean from today comes from the, the Word of God, the Bible. It also comes from some Jewish writings called the Mishnah. Uh, have you ever heard the Mishnah? They've got the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the Midrash. And there's also a book called Josephus, uh, written by Josephus. It's, it's the Antiquities of the Jews. And, uh, and, so the, and actually Roman history, first century Roman history, we glean from some of that. So if you hear information, you go, wait a minute. I've never read that in the Bible. That's probably because it's coming from the Midrash or the uh, you know, Talmud or something like that. The Bible gives us a good, clear picture. Uh, but one thing that has happened in my life, um, most people, I see some younger people in here that probably don't know what a dot to dot is. <laughs> yeah, I see old people know it. See, you're already laughing. You just, they, anybody, if you know what a dot to dot art book is, raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, you even know dot to dot. Yeah. So you're not on computers all the time. Okay. So so this is a dot to dot. This is the, and, and and you know we all. I when I was a kid, I used to go like this all the time and see. I would never even finish them. Just see if you can figure out what it was. You look at it, go, what is it? What is it? And so you're and you, and you go to the next one. And that's why we we treat Palm Sunday. That's why we treat Resurrection Day. Is we hear the same thing, we drop, oh, no, okay, next page. And we just, we hear the same thing, but what the Holy Spirit does as he begins to teach us, he bring, begins to color in the lines and begin to fill in all the dots. And pretty soon it starts taking shape and color. And uh, the more information, the longer you live. And as, as information comes your way, all of a sudden it jumps off the page and becomes animated and becomes real. And pretty soon Jesus just isn't on a subject you talk about in Bible school, but it's something that touches your heart. That's what it's supposed to be. See, religion just wants you just the same thing. Palm Sunday. Jesus come in. Hey, hallelujah. Palm Sunday. Go through. Communion. Uh, uh, break bread. Same thing. Oh, church. The Holy Spirit came to be our great teacher. He's our teacher. And he's going to teach tonight. Amen? Amen. I hope you're ready. 
And uh, some things we're not going to, uh, the, the second half uh, is divided up in by songs. And there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some music. Uh, I shouldn't say songs and I shouldn't say music. There's some ministry that's going to take place. And I don't want to touch your heart. First of all, I don't want to touch your head for sure. Even though there's a lot. How many Bible nerds we have in here? That's a good thing if you're a Bible nerd. Raise your hand. There's gobs of Bible nerd information, okay? <laughs> don't You may not try to, you won't be able to keep up if you try to take notes. But if you're a Bible nerd, you will love this. And I really don't want to, see, information just informs you, but revelation will empower you. And that's what the Word of God's supposed to do. And so I don't want to touch your head. And believe it or not, I don't want to touch just your heart. And I know that's going to happen. You won't, if you're sitting here, you won't be, you won't be the same. I want to get down to the marrow in your bones. <laughs> That's my goal. Normally we have a teaching that we sit here and we teach, we laugh, we go home. Oh no. If, if, please. Uh, so, so if, if you have the, you know, most churches come equipped with what they call seat belts on their pews and their seats. And when you sit down, you hook it so you can't get out until the service is over. You can't get up during worship. Just do yourself a favor. Just reach over there right now. Symbolically, do it. Reach over, press that release button, and let go of that religious thing that keeps your butt so heavy you can't get it up and out of the chair. Because if you feel like, and there will be some places in the second half, if you feel Joy and I have been working on this for a, a long period of time, lots of hours in it, and we can't watch it without some kind of it is made to move you. We, I think we showed our ones on on Monday night. I think you were moved. You can't watch it and not be moved. I'll say this: if you can watch this, the second half, and not be moved. We want to get you saved tonight. <laughs> we really do. And um, so there's two sections. We're going to break with a meal in between. There's four, four ministry songs in the last section. And um, that's enough of that. And when we're reading a scripture, if I stop, since it's crowd participation day, if I read a scripture and I stop and there's a word to be said, and you know that's the next word, guess what everybody's job is? Does everybody know what to do? Put Colossians chapter 2, verse, verse 14, real quick. Well, this is going to come up in the second half. Just do a little practice because I want you to be ready to go when it happens. It says, having wiped out the handwritings of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken... Yeah. Oh, that's real bad. That's real bad. That was yeah. a bad. Let me do that again. And he has taken yeah. out of the way, having nailed. Yeah. Very good. And I'll remind you later, but that's how this game is played. Okay. I mean, it's home church. You don't have to be religious in a home church. All right. Get that off of there. All right. Well, I'm going to share with you how this came to me. And that's the best. I've tried to rework it, do other, get fancy with it. And I can't. I just got to give it the way it's. I, I used to ask the question all the time. And during this is the Paul, you know, we talk about Palm Sunday. Why? Why did the priests care? Did you ever ask that question? You, you got Jesus coming in, all the disciples. Why were the priests even worried? Why would they want the disciples to be quiet? It made no sense to me. I, I asked these kinds of questions. And once I asked that one question, that's when the party started. Information just became a download of over the years. And, and uh, what God showed me was, I don't know if you know this, but during that, this time, at that time when Jesus was coming in, the guesstimation of the population of Jerusalem during Passover was 200 to 300,000 people. First of all, you need to start 
shaking our little heads here. Now, remember, my job of a teacher isn't to convince you what I know is right. My job of a teacher is to shake your head, make you think. So the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, can teach you and guide you. So I'm not here to convince you. Matter of fact, I'm not here to convince you of anything. My, my job here is to be a voice of the Holy Spirit, and hopefully your mind will go, what? Just like what I said about the gospel. You know, the gospel is not about making bad people good. It's not. It's about bringing life to dead people. And with that life, they'll change. But if you're just trying to make bad people good, changes, I mean, what good's the outside changing if the heart isn't? So it's, it's stuff like that you need to hear to help, because we just get in this American religious rut is really what we have. We're an American. We don't we don't know anything about Jewish culture, Jewish history. We don't know the Bible was the most of the New Testament was written to Jewish people from from their perspective and their context. And we're going to put all, a lot of scripture back into context. Context is just not the scriptures around the one you're reading. Context is the history, the climate, the culture, what's happening in the time. Who's who's it being spoken to personally? Is it written to the Gentiles or written to the Jews? These are the things that make Scripture come alive and change the way we understand them. So, and so when I was looking, at, turn with me in the book of Luke. Joy's going to put all the Scriptures. Uh, we're going to go very fast. And I don't know what else to say about that. Turn past reset. <laughs> So Jerusalem had at the time of Passover, there were seven feasts that the children of Israel uh, fellowshiped in every year. There were three what is called pilgrimage feasts. Passover is one of the feasts that required, if you could be there at all, required your participation to be in Jerusalem. Uh, Pentecost was another one of those. And matter of fact, when you read in Scripture, when you read in the other Gospels, you'll see that one says the whole city was moved. Another gospel says that there were Greeks there. Why were Greeks there? Why were Gentiles part of Passover? Well, they had been they're, they're Gentiles that had been converted into Judaism, and they also came at Passover. They also traveled on those three uh, pilgrimage, pilgrimage uh, events to Jerusalem. Now, what's really interesting when you stop and think about this, so the Greeks that were there for Passover were the same Greeks that were there for Pentecost. Mm -hmm. See, stuff like that you got to start thinking about because they would have traveled there for Pentecost. The ones at Pentecost are ones that heard the disciples when they were speaking in their, their uh, glossolalia, their unlearned language. They were hearing God being magnified in their dialectos, their dialect. Their, their, their spoken language, and they were amazed. Well, these were the same ones that saw Jesus crucified at Calvary. Oh, see, that's when the, the thing starts being colored in and, and taking shape and, and starting getting some, some flavor to it, and it's more than just dot to dot. And so you have 300, 200 to 300,000 people all in this place, and what, what I started learning was that for 15, say, say 1,500. For over 1,500 years, the best way we can calculate it is around uh, 1,543 to 1,546 years. They, in, in Scripture, they were told to celebrate Passover. Do you, you know how Passover started? Does everybody know Passover? Children of Israel were in Egypt, and they were in bondage. And matter of fact, let's just stop right there. Go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, I believe it is. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. This is the beginning of what is known as Palm Sunday. Every one of the seven feasts had a beginning. Do you understand that? It started, Passover had a start with the children of Israel in bondage, and the Passover lamb was slain, and the blood hyssops, 
the hyssop leaves were used, the same hyssops that were there at Calvary, not, well, not the same ones, but the same plant, <laughs> used to put the blood on the doorpost and the lentils over the doorways that the slaves lived in so the death angel would what? Pass over. But the lamb had to get there first. It just didn't show up. Matter of fact, when you understand the culture and the, the understanding of the Passover lamb, it had to be a, a male lamb of one, I mean, it had to be a lamb of a less than a year old, uh, not, not, not more than a year old. It had to be perfect. And so when a lamb was born, they would keep it with them as a pet. Now st stop and think about it. How many people have a pet? Raise your hand. Crowd participation day. You have a pet puppy, a pet dog, something. Well, they would raise this lamb as a pet, knowing that it was going to be sacrificed. So it just wasn't an object that you could just get rid of. It was something that was dear and precious to your heart. You had built relationship with this sacrifice. Now, remember, we're going to talk about how Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is our high priest. There's going to be a list of things. You're going to, if you, 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 there is a possible way to take all the information about the lamb, put it over here, all the information about the priest over here, all the information about being master rabbi with Samika here, and all the information about king over here. And, but it's just too hard. This is, so anyway, so this all started back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, where the first concept of bringing a lamb into your home, into your house. That's the concept of Palm Sunday, where a lamb is brought into the house. So at Passover, for over 1,500 years, they would bring the Passover lamb up, whether they were in tabernacle or whether they are in temple. They weren't always in Jerusalem, but they were wandering in the tents. They still did the same thing. They would bring the Passover lamb through the eastern gate or through the eastern entrance of the of the tent, the uh, tabernacle. tabernacle. And as they brought them in, they would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for 1,500 years. This is what they've been doing. So at Passover, when Jesus is now coming into the eastern gate, before he gets there, he's out there, and he's coming down this road, and the the city is out there, We've got a map we're going to show you later how far Bethany is. He's making a journey from Bethany to Jerusalem, which is two miles. It's just over the hill. Just Jerusalem's over here. Bethany goes up. It goes up. And he descends the Mount of Olives. Does anybody know what Jesus says when he descends the Mount of Olives? And the priests go, tell your disciples, be quiet. Why, why do they tell him to be quiet? I said, it, it's an amazing thing that, because we think rocks and stones. Oh, you want to back? What? Want that back? Sure. Put it back. Okay, there's Bethany, and there's the. This is the route he would have taken, and this is. A, a, go ahead and put the Mount of Olives. See, we think it was gravel and these little rocks were caught. No, what where Jesus was at, he was in the middle of this cemetery. This is the Mount of Olives, looking from the Temple Mount back at the Mount of Olives. All these are gravestones. This is the other. Look in the other direction. This is on top of the Mount of Olives, looking or not on top in the middle, looking down of the. He was in the middle of a graveyard. And when Jesus said, listen, if my disciples were to stop and be quiet, these stones would cry out. He wasn't talking about gravel. He was talking the saints of old. These people would come out of the grave and shout his glory. They did a week later anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but still, why does that tell us? Why, why were the priests out there See. I believe, like other people believe, that Jesus was right behind the Passover lamb. I used to wonder, well, which one was it? Was Jesus in front of the Passover lamb or was he behind the Passover lamb? And then the Holy Spirit just kind of slapped me upside the head and said, he didn't call me stupid, but I took it that way. He, he, he let me. Jesus was the what? The final sacrifice. So there are those like myself who believe that Jesus was right behind the Passover lamb physically coming into the Jerusalem at the same exact time. And the priests were out there to celebrate the coming in of the Passover lamb. 
But Jesus is coming in right behind the Passover. Instead of the Passover lamb getting shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, three of the gospels say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, why is that a difference? The first time that that's been shared since 1,500 years. What we need to understand, and this is where history comes in, and you can look this up. There was a guy named Pilate. We're going to do this as simple as we can. There was a guy named Pilate. His sole job under Caesar was to keep anarchy and rebellion from manifesting in Jerusalem and all of Israel. He lived in a place called Caesarea by the sea. Caesarea, when you spell it out, it's Caesarea. It was a fancy town. It was a resort town on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea with a great view. This is where he lived. The only time he ever came to Jerusalem when there was an opportunity for rebellion and anarchy to develop in Jerusalem. His job was to squelch any chance of rebellion. Does anybody know what an aquila is? That's the eagle on a stick. Joy's going to put a picture of the eagle. That's a Roman aquila. You've seen it in the movies. Pilate would come in the southwestern gate. Go ahead and put the, the picture of uh, Jerusalem. This is where Pilate would have came in. He would have came in from this way with his soldiers into the dung date. This actually, this valley here, uh, you may know what that valley is called, especially when I mention it. It's called the Valley of Gehenna. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. When Jesus talked, uh, I'll just tell you this. Out of the 18 times Jesus spoke the word Gehenna, 15 of them were about this place right here. It wasn't about a place you go when you die. I'll just bring that up. Just rock your little worlds. And so Caesar, or, I mean, uh, Pilate is coming in what is known as the dung gate, coming into here. At the same time, Jesus is coming down the eastern gate, coming in here. And what's he listening for? Any sign of rebellion? He wants to squelch it. He doesn't even want to. Wait a minute. You have 200 to 300,000 people saying in a loud voice, blessed, blessed is the king. the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand this is not just talking about, yes, they knew Jesus had done miracles. Yes, and we'll talk about that in a second. Jesus had performed the four messianic miracles that no one, only the Messiah, we'll talk about in a second, could perform but we need to understand that they knew their scripture. Jewish people know their Old Testament history. Do you understand that? Put Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah 9.9 says this, and this is known as what is called a remez. Has anybody heard the, the phrase a remez before, other than Brad and Carol? Okay, you've been here for a while. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> huh, you've heard the term. Well, well, we'll help you out. The Jewish people have a way of, of teaching, and they have a way of teaching not getting in trouble uh, because it's against the it was against the law to quote scripture that was anti Caesar. Do you understand that? They were under dumb. Matter of fact, uh, the Jewish people paid to pray. Uh, remember when Jesus asked, "What's in your pocket?" And one of the priests reached in his pocket and they pulled out a coin and whose face was on it? Caesar. And that was an idol. You realize that that was an idol. Uh, but see, that was a see, oh, imperial worship. Roman Caesar worship was the dominant religion worship throughout the kingdom of Rome, their empire. They didn't care what you worshiped as long as you considered their worship Caesar first. You couldn't confess anybody to be Lord other than Caesar. Caesar. See, that's why Paul was in trouble, and that's why John was on the island of Patmos. That's why the Romans hated the Jews, but they despised the Christians because we would not pay to pray. You could worship anything you want, any way you wanted, as long as you paid the authorities permission. As a, and That was your offering. And so the, the, uh, the Jewish authorities had already surrendered their allegiance to the government at hand. I'll just leave that one alone. I stepped on that one, didn't I? Okay, let's go there real quick. They'd already surrendered their allegiance. It says, but look at what it says here. This is one of the things that was, that was spoken of. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just 
and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That and see a, a remez is where they let, let me let me show you what a remez is. Uh, for God so loved the world, He gave. That's so whoever believeth. Yeah. See, see, I don't have to say that. I can't get in trouble because I didn't quote scripture. Oh. <laughs> see that? You didn't get in trouble because you didn't quote scripture. This is a remez. Now, wait a minute. It would have sounded something like this. Go back to the first again. I would say, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout a daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Next verse, watch this. I will cut off the what? Chariot. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse or the war horse from Jerusalem. See, when Pilate would come in, he'd be on a horse or a chariot carrying his Aquila. And this is saying that that king that's coming in is going to cut this off. They knew. I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse or the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be. The aquila is the eagle on a battle bow. The stick is called the battle bow. It will be. Do that sound like anarchy? So the priests are out there going, shh. Oh, we'll tell your disciples. See, the disciples were saying, blessed is the king. Everybody else was saying, blessed is he. The ones that knew scripture. First uh, Kings chapter one verse thirty three, I think that's it. You got to excuse me. Listen, you don't want me to go through all my notes. I never look at this verse. First Kings chapter three. Now the, the, this is. Does anybody know what first? When, who's talking? Let me just read this. The king also said to them, it's King David, uh, take with you the servants of your lord and have Solomon son, uh, uh, Solomon my son. So this is the son of what? Say David. David. Jesus oh, Jesus is what? Okay, they knew their scripture, right? And so, you got to get the picture. I get, I get too excited doing this. Okay, I will be jumping up and down before that. And if you've never seen a fat man jump up and down, it's worth seeing. <laughs> you need to stick around. Uh, the, 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 the king also said to them. Take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my, my own. Yeah. Can you say donkey? donkey? And take him down to Gahan. It's a spring. It's right It's right there where the Kidron Valley. See, so you have the uh, Valley of Gehenna over on this side and the Kidron Valley over here on this side, which is on the east side. There and let uh, Zadok the priest and Nathan the the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say Lord uh, say long live the king. Solomon. See they they knew this and once they went down they had to come up and bring him up the eastern side of the city into the eastern gate and they knew their scripture and they knew that the son of David had history of riding in on a donkey coming in the eastern gate and Jesus is the son of David. Being anointed as king, riding on a donkey. See, if a king comes into a town on a horse, it's a sign of domination and under battle and war. King comes in on a donkey, it's a sign of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. Don't even get me started talking about that. He's the prince of peace. Man, oh man. This kind of stuff. This is good. We got so, oh gosh, there's so much of this. I don't have to explain. They knew their scripture. So when they saw the people shouting, Son of David, what were they referring? First Kings chapter 1, verse 33. It happened before. And why is that important? We're going to find out later at the end why it's important that Jesus didn't come. He wasn't a Levi. Where did a priest come from? What tribe did I already gave it away. He would, you know what this says? We're going to read, this is such a powerful scripture. 
we're, I was supposed to save it to last. I guess we'll say it again at the last. But the, the, the scripture literally says in Hebrew, when there's a change of priest, there's a change in the law. That when this system isn't fulfilled because of another system, another system with another priest has another law than this one. Oh, new covenant, new covenant people. Yes. Grace. New covenant. Oh man, I want to get off on so much other stuff, but I can't. I got to go through this. I know, you have to go six days. What? Do the six days. Oh, we're getting there. So, what? Well, so now we're going to take a journey. That's how it all started for me. Was understanding the the palm leaves. See, see, because they were under Roman occupation, a Roman rule, uh, they couldn't have a flag of Israel. So historically, the palm leaf was like them raising their flag, flying their flag. The clothes on the on the ground was like a carpet. Now, how many people, if there, if you have a two mile, how, how far is it to that highway up there? A mile? About a mile. About a mile? Okay. So let's just say, how, if there's 200 to 300,000 people excited about, about the Passover lamb coming in the Eastern Gate, for 1,500 years they've been doing this, I, I can see a whole lot of people lining all the way. Just a lot of people. Now, what we need to understand, let, let, let's go to, to John chapter 12, verse 1. And this is where we need to really start opening up our minds and our hearts and start reading Scripture instead of just reading Scripture. We need to be hearing what Scripture says. Uh, and, and I can't, it's just it's just kind of brain the brain I got. It just says, then six days. Say six days. Six. How many people stop and ask, why six days? That does not mean anything. That doesn't mean anything to most people in America about six days. Well, six days, what? Then six days before the Passover. You know what it says in the Talmud or the Mishnah? It says six days before the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed. Six days before that, the Passover lamb's feet are inspected. Its hooves are inspected. They pick one out and say, is this going to be the Passover lamb? And they inspect that Passover lamb. When they find one that has perfect unblemished hooves, they anoint that lamb's feet with what? Oil. Oil. Wait a minute. How does this fit scripture? Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, which is two miles away from Jerusalem, where Lazarus was, who he had been dead, uh, who had raised from the dead. You know the story. We'll get to that in a second or hour. <laughs> there they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Everybody know what spikenard is? Spikenard, uh, it's literally, it, it, it would take a, day's, uh, a year's wages to purchase a pound of spikenard. Uh, because uh, in their culture and their history tells us that, that spikenard was outlawed for common people to use it because it was so expensive. It could only be used if a king came to your house. Our king came into a, then spikenard because it was very uh, fragrant, very aromatic. And you stop and think, why did they need that kind of oil? Well, in their custom, when someone came to your house, number one, you would always eat. You always see that in Scripture. Whenever Jesus went to someone's house, they were what? And that's one of the traditions of men I like. Because every time we come to this house, we what? We eat. Now, because we have plumbing, and see, the spikenard, or, or the scented oil, was to help. Uh, the first thing you did when you met them, you greeted them and you gave them spikenard. Or you, are you not spying? Are you giving some other scented oil? You know why? Uh, it, it, it's called, uh, uh, it, it covered up the fragrance of the trip. You know what I'm saying? It, they didn't have air conditioning. It was hot. They sweat a lot. And so the scented oil, the perfume would cover up the, well, I wasn't going to go that way, but yeah, that's, that's the right <laughs> word. Yeah, yeah. It'd make their stay more pleasant. And so when you see this, so it was only used for kings and, and or for burial. That's why I used it for burial, because it would cover up the smell of the decaying flesh. Got it? And so here you go. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Yeah, but one, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, 
who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? First, we're not going to get into the sermon part of this stuff. We're just going to get into the informational part of this stuff. Uh, and what did Jesus say? What was his response? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used that to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my... Now, who could only use... Kings got to use when they came into your house, and it was used also for her, for his burial. Now, they didn't make no... They didn't know what he was talking about. She didn't know why she was... See, sometimes... Sometimes God has you do things you just don't know why. I got a real deep word for you. It's okay. Just do it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to understand it. If God's calling you to do something, quit trying to figure it out before you do it. Just do it. Watch this. This was not normal, was it? So she was willing to go beyond what was normal. She was willing to break Tradition. I couldn't make a point in this, but I'm going to let you make it yourself. Are you willing to break what is normal and break tradition to do what God's called you to do, even though you don't understand it? Amen. Oh, come on, church. I do it, but I don't understand it, no. but I do it. This is, this is so powerful. Six days in their custom for 1,500 years, they would find a, a lamb that was going to be sacrificed six days before. And guess what? Oh, but do you think we're done? Turn to Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Do we have the same story again? It's only just begun. <laughs> After what? There we go again. I just had to see this going, oh no. Is there something significant about now two days? Wait a minute. After two days, the Passover, the feast, unleavened bread, and the, the chief priests and the scribes sought that they might take him by trickery and put him to death. That's, that's but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar. Uh, okay, let's start right here. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. This is what? Two days before yeah. Passover? As he sat on the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil, spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on. See, in the Mishnah, it tells the Jewish people for 1,500 years that when they find that lamb that's perfect and they brought it into Jerusalem, when they agree that it's a this is the lamb, two days before the Passover, they would take spikenard and coat its head with oil to show that it's perfect from head to toe. So Jesus is our what? Passover lamb that's perfect. From what? See, I believe, like other people believe, that the very moment the priests were putting oil on the hooves, I believe the moment the first drop of oil hit the hoof of that Passover lamb, the first drop of spikenard was hitting Jesus' feet. I believe the, the very time that, that the lamb was having oil placed on his head, Jesus having oil placed. I believe it happened at the exact same moment in time. Amen. That's just the way our God is. Amen. Nothing is by chance. Everything is for a reason and a purpose. We just need to open up our heart and start hearing what the Spirit has for us and learning the customs and the the uh, the the, the of the Jews and what they went through with the scriptures and things. But this is powerful. Amen. What we need to understand too is that after, after the, the feet have been oiled of the Passover lamb, guess how 
Guess how the sheep gets there? Guess how the lamb gets to Jerusalem? He can't. He can't. If he, if he took a chip, if he would have walked, he could have hurt his hoof, and he wouldn't be perfect. So the priest would carry him. His feet would never touch the ground again until he got into Jerusalem. Wait a minute. How did Jesus get into Jerusalem? From the moment his feet were anointed with oil, it says immediately he called for a donkey. That's good stuff. His feet never touched the road again for that period of time. Just like the Passover lamb. So it just wasn't a donkey because he was the son of David and a king coming in. He's also a Passover lamb. Now you're going to find out Jesus was, as he's fulfilling Passover lamb, he's fulfilling priest, he was fulfilling king, he's fulfilling Messiah, all at the same time. Because he is all that. Only God can do all this. Yeah. Well, there's so much I'm going to forget to say, and there's so much yet to be said, and, and there's so much more to be known. It's just, it's just this kind of stuff is just amazing. It just and So we're going to go back here again. We started here at the triumphal entry. You know, the priest said, uh, tell your disciples, be quiet. We talked about the Roman Aquila. We talked about what was happening in Rome at the time uh, with with Pilate and the conflict of interest going on. Jesus, now we're going back. You know, we started out, here's the, the two days, the six days, and then we're going to go back a little further. We're going to talk about the, the four Messianic miracles. that only the See, the Jewish believe there's four things that only the Messiah could do. All other miracles had been done. There had been people raised from the dead. There be, uh, had been uh, demons cast out of people. But there were certain things. There had been people healed. Uh, but there are four things that uh, only the Messiah could do. And can anybody name what those are? One of them is the uh, healed the blind. Not just there was blind people healed, but there was a certain kind of blind eye. That born, born. Had to be born blind. That means he had had no eyeballs. Ooh. It just wasn't about getting rid of the cataracts. It was that only the Messiah could, re since God created everything, only the Messiah, who was God, could create eyeballs. It had to be a creative miracle of sight where the eyeballs had to be created. And what did Jesus do? He got some dust. He spit in it, shoved them in his, in his eyes, and the miracle took place. Matt, we need to, and before we start listening to these miracles, we need to understand that Jesus, he was declaring who he was by everything he did and what he said Remember, what was the first words out of Jesus' mouth in Matthew? He said, repent for the what? Amen. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. We need to understand that six verses later, he went. the scripture says he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in how many synagogues? All the synagogues, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven is not going to heaven. That's called heaven. The kingdom of heaven is what's on earth. He wasn't preaching about going to heaven. He was preaching about ruling and reigning in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, wait a minute. Stop. Our Father who art in heaven is not called kingdom. It's called heaven. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? In the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. The message that Jesus, the message that Jesus taught was not the message about him and you going to heaven. It was about him and you living in heaven, the kingdom of heaven, finding hell on earth and bringing heaven. Live it in a way that you're going to bring God glory on earth in the midst of a tro yeah. troubled times. That was his message. How did he get in every synagogue? Have you we ever stopped and thought about that? How did Jesus go throughout all? Galilee teaching in all the synagogues a message they never heard. Do you ever wonder about that? And if you know the answer, Carol, don't say nothing. <laughs> Just see, I told you she was going to do it. No, I did. I can't help. I know. That's what we were listening. Every time we listen to 
Joy's always answering the question and the people, no one else can hear, but the people, she forgets the mics right there. On the, oh, yeah, yeah. And so on YouTube, everybody's here. Oh, she told me the answer. She's not letting them think, you know. <laughs> we want you to think. How did he get into all the synagogues and all of Galilee and not get kicked out? Preaching a message they hadn't heard. Unless he had something that other rabbis didn't have. Unless he wasn't just a poor carpenter's son. Oh, we need to break some mindset. He was anything but poor. He wasn't poor. Joseph and Mary weren't poor carpenters. They were at one time. But when them camels came in, <laughs> their life changed. Oh, come on. We think there's three little camels. And just There's a chunk of gold. No, we, we can't get into that. That's another message for another holiday. So what we need to understand, he was a, it's called a master rabbi with Samika. All right. What was, what was Peter's first, when he shouted, Jesus is walking on shore, and, and he said, hey, catch any fish. And what did Peter respond? He goes, master. Why do you call him master? Because Jesus even looked like a master rabbi with Samika. Rabbi with Samika means he had authority to interpret scripture and apply it his own Remember the story of Jesus in the, the temple and they brought the lady caught in adultery and they said, Moses' law says this, but what do? Why were they asking him if they didn't care? Just, just stop and think about this. Would they let anybody teach in the temple? Come on, people. Got a question for you, another one. How come he didn't go to jail for turning over... Causing, he turned over the tables, kicked out the money, the system that they had for selling their offerings. He, he destroyed it, and he didn't go to jail. Why? Because he had authority to do so. And he said, not in my father. Man, I tell you what, church. We, we, it's, it's, you see, it's the traditions of men that make the word of God of what? No, no effect. When we're more, when we don't go, we're, see, most people are just believe what they've been told, and they haven't researched what they've been told. Oh, there's so much more. Oh, the scripture comes alive. Sometimes the Bible just gives us a hint. But the Midrash, the, the Talmud, and the, the, the Mishnah. Oh. Where was I at? Okay. So everywhere. Matter of fact, Jesus... Stop and think about this. He's in his own hometown. He's in the synagogue. He walks in. Oh, the master rabbi. Do you think they're going to let anybody speak that walks in? The book of Isaiah. You know how cherished that is to a Jew? I mean, they come, it's like, oh, they, they have a special place. They put it. Oh, look, a carpenter with dirty hands and slivers. 12 years old. Here, will you come read this? No. They recognized he was a master rabbi. Would you please read our, our daily, our, our reading of the week? They had regular readings they did. He opened up, he read out of the book of what? Isaiah. Isaiah. And he read what he read that he came to deliver. This, you know, this open blind eyes, set liberty to the captives. He came to do all the things. And then here's the point I want to get at. Is then, then he what? He, put the, he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant. And then what did he do? Today, what? Today, what did he do? Not what did he say? Sat down. Oh. He sat down. And then said. They stay. Where did he sit? We don't ask these questions. Where did he sit? There was a chair, two chairs on in the synagogue. One the rabbi sat in, and the other one had never, ever been set in. It had two names. One is the seed of Moses or the seed of the Messiah. And when he sat down in the seat of the Messiah saying today, he read a scripture saying what the Messiah was going to do and then sat in a seat that only the Messiah had the authority to sit in. And then they declared today, this scripture is fulfilled. And they marveled. They didn't get upset until he brought up some scripture. 
of their past. The only two people that received any blessings in some of their history were Gentiles. Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Next verse. The loon is what? The loon. loons just came back. Just call it. I'm loony? Oh. <laughs> That's kind of cool. So all bore witness. Everybody else don't know that. So all bore witnesses to him and marveled at their great. They marveled. They love in this man at his gracious words were proceeded out of his mouth. You ever stop and wonder why he had so many people in the Sermon on the Mount? Then I saw at, at his, his first message along the sea there. He's given this great discourse. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people there. Why? Just because he healed some people? He was a master rabbi. There had not been a master rabbi since Jesus was 14 years old. And they wanted to hear what. In Matthew chapter 5, five times it says, you've heard it said. That's a reference to what another, the last master rabbi had interpreted scripture. The woman caught in adultery. They want to know what he had to say. The law of Moses says this, but what did, how do you apply? What do you say about this? He said, okay, I'm not going to change it at all. I'll just change the application. You that have no, no sin, cast the first stone. <laughs> See, a master rabbi can change the application, not change the law, but the way it's applied. Okay? So, so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Wow, it's amazing. And he said, you will surely say this, uh, this proverb to me, Phys physician, heal, heal yourself. Whatever we have uh, uh, heard done in uh, Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. This is where he should have stopped. But like a good preacher, you don't know when to stop. <laughs> What's it mean when I say just one more scripture? Absolutely nothing. That's your reply, okay? <laughs> but I, t <laughs> but I, t I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a great famine throughout all the land. land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to, where? She's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. So God sent, the prophet of God was sent outside of Jerusalem under the law to heal somebody. Wow. Same thing with the next one. We won't take time to read it. Then they hated him. Then they wanted to throw him off the cliff. Well, because he, was... he was telling them how, how ridiculous. They're not going to receive. I mean, it was contrast. They loved him in one minute for what he said, but when they brought up their past, they said, you're just like your past. God's going to do more in the Gentile world. Mm, we won't go there. So the four Messiah miracles, one was healing the, the, the creative miracle of healing a blind eye. Notice the boy was blind from birth. Now we could turn to all these, but it would just take, you understand, it would just take too much time. I feel pretty safe in this, that if you're here on a Saturday, on a, one of the prettiest days, we or the prettiest day we've had all year, <laughs> that you're a Bible nerd and you don't need to be saved. <laughs> Can I take that for granted? Okay. So I don't need it. We don't need You're going to go home and read these scriptures. You probably know these scriptures better than I do. Okay? So blind eye uh, miracle took place. Only the Messiah could do that. Another miracle was uh, uh, casting out a demon. What kind of demon? A deaf mute demon. Why could it have to only be a deaf mute demon? Only the Messiah could. Because they had, once you knew a demon's name, you could cast it out. But guess what? A deaf mute demon could you could never know its name. Only the Messiah would have the authority to cast out a deaf mute demon or a demon out of a person that's deaf mute. You got it? Now in between those two miracles and the next miracle, there's another story that takes place. You ever got you know a guy named Jairus? Yeah. All right. Jairus was a ruler of a synagogue. 
And he had a, a, a daughter who was what? Say 12 years old. Very good. You knew that. The daughter was 12 years old, and the daughter means that she was a young girl. She was a young girl of 12 years old. And on his way to heal Jairus, and there's a whole there's a great message in this. We're not going to preach it. We're going to teach it. On his way, Jesus' way with Jairus to heal uh, his daughter of 12 years old, a woman in the crowd who had a, she was an older woman with what? Issue of blood for how many years? 12. Listen, when the Bible talks numbers, pay attention. This was, Can you say this was an older woman? Of 12 years with an issue of blood. Why 12? Now she has faith. She knows scripture. Everybody knew scripture. See, it says it, what was, is it in, uh, it's uh, Malachi 4, try 2. It may not be 4, 2. No, oh, but, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his what? Wings. You, you know what his wings are? See, there's a prayer shawl that uh, not everybody wore them, but people with authority, like rabbis, like master rabbis, they would carry a prayer, they would wear a prayer shawl at all times. The prayer shawl is called a tallit. And, and the corners of the tallit, does everybody, do you have a prayer shawl? We don't even get a prayer, oh, we didn't bring all that stuff. Oh, goodness. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it, it's called a tallit. The prayer shawl is called a tallit. And on the fringes of the, the hem and the corners is called a kanaf. Say kanaf. It's kind of a neat word. Kanaf. That's the kanaf. So the tallit is surrounded the edge with a kanaf and, and the corners. And that's called, the corners are called the wings. Okay. And the scripture says that the Messiah, the son of righteousness, is going to have healing in his kanaf. And his wings, that's what, it, you look it up, it's going to say, cut off. And you go, hey, man, that guy was right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, anyway. And so she knew this, and she needed healing. She had already spent all her wealth and money she had going to every doctor. That almost sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Spending all your money on giving to all these people that said to give, and God's going to heal you, and you've been to this church and that church and that evangelist and this one, and you're dead broke and you're still sick. Maybe that's because we've been looking in all the wrong places, listening to all the wrong things, instead of trusting Scripture for what it says. So she reaches out and touches Kanaf. And what happens? Virtue rushes out of him. Why? Because he's the Messiah. It says it's going to happen. She had faith in the Scripture, do we? Oh, we won't go there. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have did that. She had faith in Scripture. Was it normal? What? what st st stop, stop and put this together. If she had an issue of blood, she had been unclean for 12 years. She couldn't touch anyone and nobody could touch her. She couldn't have a hug. If she had grandchildren, she couldn't. Like social distancing to me. Sounds like social distancing. <laughs> what would have happened if she would have touched someone and made them unclean? She would have been stoned. Notice she was fearful. When Jesus turned to see who was there, what does he say? Who? Do you think everybody knew that she had an issue of blood and was unclean? What was the, what was the next step? For an unclean person to touch the Messiah, touch Jesus, stone. And she says she was fearful. Why was she fearful? She knew she, wait a minute, was it normal for an unclean person to touch a clean person? She was willing, she was willing, listen, she wanted her healing bad enough to die for it. She wanted her healing bad enough to be stoned for it. But she had enough faith to go beyond her fear of dying for it. That's good preaching right there. If we were doing a sermon, we're not doing a sermon. Wait a minute, this is an old woman of hell. How many tribes of Israel were there? And women always represent church. 
structure, group, family. So the old way had 12 tribes of Israel. And what was the main issue of all the 12 tribes? The law. Blood. The law required blood. Before Jesus could heal, how many disciples were there? Does anybody see in this picture? That Jesus had to deal with the issue of blood in the Old Covenant. You understand? Do I need to go there? I don't want to go there yet. That's in the half, next half. He had to deal with the issue of blood in the Old Covenant before he could turn around and give life to the New Covenant of 12. Don't even get me started. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Mountain of transfer. Mountain of transfiguration, you call it. I call it mountain of transfer. Matthew 17. Moses and Elijah represent the old covenant. Jesus represents the new covenant. And they were transferring the authority from the old covenant to Jesus in the new covenant. Moses and took the law. See, Moses brought the law down from a mountain, took it back up and kept on going. And Jesus came down the mountain without the law. Mm-hmm. Just simple, simple little Bible nerd nuggets. That's a good way. That would be a good I toilet read. Bible first. nerd nuggets. He'd give the one first television to no one. What? Yeah. And he said, Jesus comes down the side. He says, tell the, don't tell anybody what God just said. What did God say? God said, "Don't this, this is my beloved son. Hear him, not them. In other words, don't mix them. Don't mix this and this and put them together. See, that's what they want to do. They want to build three tabernacles. God said, no. I wish I could hear him. And he says, don't tell nobody about this vision until the Son of Man is... Risen from the grave. So in other words, they were still under the old covenant at the time, but the new covenant was coming. And under the new covenant, it actually says in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God in times past had spoken to our pe- our fathers through the laws and the prophets, but now through Christ. But we're still listening to the laws and the prophets. Man. <clears throat> We're at the hour mark. Yeah. So, so for the, for those that are watching on Facebook Live, this will be cut up in our section. So if you happen to what happened, well, find it on Facebook Live. Plus, we don't know how long our instruments are going to last battery-wise. So, thank you for that.